Hello. Hi. And uh, welcome back to this uh, installment of the presentations I, hear do, I do here at the Hopkinton Council on Aging um, at the, here at the Senior Center. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an attorney at Myrick O'Connell. Uh, there are 70 of us there, 60 in uh, Worcester, 20 in Westboro, and 10 in Boston. And that's the reason why I get to do nothing but elder law, because all those other people do other stuff. Um, for the, some of you, I, I think we're here actually for the earlier presentation that I did earlier this spring about uh, elder law updates for, for my friends Frank and Mary. Uh, we always talk about my friends Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Uh, and their basic estate plan, which is if one of them dies, everything goes to the other. And if the following the death of the two of them, everything goes to their kids. And in that situation, if they're married, there are certain issues that they're really not worried about very much. They're not worried about what happens if one of them gets sick because typically the other one is handling things for them. They don't worry as much about if one of them dies because things are being held jointly. But it, it, if it's just, it, but if it's, if it's just Mary, because Frank, well, he may have been terrific or he may have been not so terrific, at this point is just a dream, um, and Mary is trying to figure out what to do, then there are some issues that are kind of unique to Mary. And I want to talk about those today. Uh, so this is Elder Law for Singles. Um, so the three things that Mary comes to me talking about after Frank has died are dealing with life, dealing with death, and dealing with what remains. Uh, and the traditional state, estate planning was most, mostly about what remains. Um, for, for my clients, though, a lot of it is really about dealing with life. So uh, we're assuming, um, or we're actually not making any assumptions here about whether all three of her kids are just wonderful or whether they're all not so wonderful, you know, or whether they get along. We're going to kind of talk about some of that stuff, though, as we go along. Uh, but we are assuming that Mary is trying to make sure that she is going to be okay while she's alive, and then when she becomes a memory, that things are taken care of. So while she is alive, she'll often ask, so what do I need? Don't I need a new will? Often the answer is no, and we're going to talk about that. What do I need? Well, you really need these documents, and often if your spouse has deceased, you may need to revise these documents. You have to have a power of attorney. You need a health care proxy. You need a HIPAA authorization. Uh, or you probably want one, and you probably want a care plan. So we're going to talk about those a little bit. Power of attorney. Power of attorney authorizes somebody to act on your behalf, um, period. Usually it does not say to act on your behalf only if you're incapacitated. So it authorizes people to act on your behalf right away. Um, so it, it, which just gives them some flexibility so that if they are going on your behalf to the bank or calling the insurance company or whatever, they don't have to prove that you're incapacitated before being able to deal with folks. So a couple things about powers of attorney. Typically, Mary would have named Frank on her power of attorney, but now she needs to name somebody else. She can name any one of the kids as her attorney. And by the way, when I say attorney, a power of att an attorney, the real definition of an attorney is an agent, a person who is acting on your behalf. You always think of, you think of me as an attorney um, oh, but I'm a special kind. I'm an attorney at law. So I'm a person who is authorized to act on your behalf in front of a judge. Because there are special rules regarding acting on your behalf in front of a judge. And judges want to make sure that we're licensed in order to do that. But in general, a power of attorney is simply naming an agent. Now, you can name one or more agents at the same time. So Mary could literally name Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. jointly and severally. Uh, and if she, they, if she names them that way, that means any one of those kids can act on her behalf at any time. So if one's not around, the other one can act, right? And so if that way also, if one of them, if Mary's having some concerns about what one of them is doing, well, the other one can always check. And we're going to talk about an example, a real life example, a little later on. Um, these documents l technically last forever, as do healthcare proxies. They actually last until you've revoked them. Um, you can do a new power of attorney, but doing a new power of attorney doesn't revoke the old power of attorney, unless you've actually specifically revoked it. Um, but I always suggest that people make sure that these things are less than five years old. The reason for that is just when you're dealing with folks regarding your power of attorney, they're not lawyers and they're not judges. They don't know that a power of attorney lasts forever, which it does, and that, which is why I suggest to people that you just get them you know, updated. They're, usually it's very cheap to do that. And that way, you're not, your, your son or daughter is not going to have a problem dealing on your behalf. 
because somebody at the bank or some broker or somebody says, oh, this looks kind of stale and old, and I don't know if it's good anymore. So you want to do that. Um, remember, if you do revoke your power of attorney, because you're dissatisfied with the person who is acting on your behalf, make sure you notify the people who that person might be dealing with, like the people at your bank or the people at the insurance company, right, or your broker. Because a, a, a power of attorney typically has language in it that is designed to make sure that any third party uh, who does, isn't otherwise notified that the power of attorney has been revoked will deal with these people. Uh, as long as they provide, as long as your attorney provides a statement to the bank or to the brokerage company saying that your power of attorney has not been revoked. The reason for that is to make it easier for your attorney to deal with all these people, because otherwise your attorney goes to the bank and says, you know, I want to do this for my, on, I want to get on my mother's account, and the person at the bank says, well, how do I know your mother didn't revoke this power of attorney? And your answer is, well, you know, because <laughs> I'm telling you, right? Well, if, if there's something written into the power of attorney that says that that person, that third party, has the right to accept an affidavit or a statement from your attorney saying that it's valid, and, and then in dealing with you is not going to be liable as long as you've said that, well, then that makes it better for your attorney. But the flip side of that is that if you're concerned about who your attorney is and you're afraid they might be using their power of attorney to take money, well, you go to, yeah, in, and you want to revoke the power of attorney, you need to go tell the bank that. Because otherwise, if that person's, even if you've revoked and told your person, if they walk into the bank and say to the bank, oh, no, I'm still the attorney, the bank's still going to take the document. Okay? So notify the bank. Your HIPAA authorization, your, your, or your health care proxy and HIPAA authorization. Your health care proxy, remember, as opposed to the power of attorney, your health care proxy, you can only name one at a time. So often people will come in and talk to me and say, oh, I want to name all my kids. I want them all to participate in any medical decisions if I'm incapable of making a decision. And I'll tell them, okay, that's great, except that if I'm the doctor, I don't want to hear from three people. I only want to hear from one person. I don't want to hear arguments about what to do with you. So your proxy has to name one person at a time. Um, if you want your other kids, though, to be participating in those conversations, then what you probably want to do is do HIPAA authorizations, authorizations to your medical provider that will authorize your doctor and the hospital, anybody that you're dealing with who's providing services to you, to talk to the other kids. Okay? That's really important for two reasons. One, if you're like a lot of folks and you've got kids all over the place and they want to be participating in these conversations and you want them to do that, well, to give them, you, by giving them the HIPAA authorizations, you're giving them all the ability to communicate with your medical professionals, maybe get copies of documents, so they can have an intelligent conversation or conference call or whatever to deal with your issues. So that's really important. Second, your healthcare proxy, in, the language is very clear in the healthcare proxy, it comes into effect the moment that your doctor says that you are not able to make a medical decision. So if you are, you've gone to the hospital and maybe you had an operation and now you're getting better, and so you're getting better, and so the doctor has not said that the, the healthcare proxy is in effect. At that point, the person named in your proxy can't talk to the doctor because the proxy only gives, it act, is activated at the moment that you, or during the time that you can't make a medical decision. So the, the authorization, the separate HIPAA authorization, doesn't, doesn't have that problem to it, so that it gives that person the ability, while you're healthy, to talk to the doctor, talk to the hospital, do communications, find out what's going on, okay? Um, remember that proxy is only effective when your doctor says that it is effective, and it stops being effective as soon as your doctor says that you're able to make decisions again. We talked about the fact you can name multiple people in your HIPAA authorizations, and that they are effective immediately. Now, if you're Mary, and you're trying to figure out how to deal with your kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., then, you, then you've got a couple of questions. First of all, if your goal is that you just want to live in your house and be buried in the backyard, then you want to make sure that that happens. Uh, but you want to make sure that in the meantime, that your assets are protected. So, and here are your assets, if you're Mary. 
You got a house that's worth 400,000, you got an IRA, 300,000, you got an annuity worth three, bank accounts worth 100, your total assets are a million one, and then Mary's income is just from Social Security, 2,000 a month, and pension 500 a month. So that's Mary. So in that situation, she comes in and says to me, well, don't I need a will? Well, the answer to that is actually no. Is actually no, because if she dies owning assets, uh, and she has no will, then those assets go through the probate process, and the probate process typically takes about a year, and the reason for that is that during the probate process, creditors of Mary have the right to file claims against Mary's estate to get paid. And that's the reason why probate always takes at least a year, because the creditors have a year, and it's only after that that the personal representative, used to be called the executor or the executrix, is supposed to distribute assets. So at the end of that period, um, if there is a will, then the, the, the executor or the personal representative abides by the terms of the will and distributes the assets. If there's no will, then the personal representative goes to the rules of intestacy, the rules that apply if there's no will in a probate case. The rules that apply if there's no will are, if you die and you have a husband, it all goes to your husband. If you die and your husband has died, it all goes to your kids. So in this case, the very same thing happens whether or not Mary has a will. So the issue isn't um, in that case whether she needs a will or not. And by the way, whether she has a will or not, if she dies owning assets, they go through the probate process, right? If she dies owning assets in her individual name. So the only time that she may specifically want to have a will is if she's got, if one of her kids has problems, if one of her kids has a money problem, or a marital problem or a disability problem because she doesn't want to inadvertently leave money to a child's creditors, which is what happens if she leaves money to a child and they've got an IRS issue or a creditor issue. Now the creditors can claim that money. She doesn't want to leave the money to, you know, that son-in-law or daughter-in-law she never liked in the first place because she leaves the money to her son and then the wife files for divorce. Now that money is in play. It's part of the pot that gets distributed between the, the son and the, and the, the, the soon-to-be ex-daughter-in-law. Or if her child has a disability. Uh, she doesn't want, by leaving assets to her child, to basically make her child ineligible for a, pro, for a government program. Because many of the disability programs uh, are, means, are means tested. So that if the, if the, if the applicant has assets, getting an inheritance could knock them off the program. So in those situations, what Mary may want to do is have a will that says that regarding that child who has a problem, those assets will be held in trust for the benefit of that child. Typically, you'd name one of the other children as the trustee. Um, and as long as the child who has the problem is not entitled to order the distribution of those assets to himself or herself, then creditors can't make him do it. The spouse can't make him do it, uh, and the money and the assets are not counted for purposes of, of qualification for government programs. So there may be a reason for a will, but, but if it's just, I want to leave it to my kids and they're all fine, you really don't need a will. The real question is, um, do you want, is there a way to avoid that probate process? And you don't do that by having a will. You do that by having no assets at the time of your death that are subject to probate. Assets are subject to probate if they're just in your name at the time of your death. Now, when you're thinking about those assets, you, you don't, don't kind of worry about, and, and by the way, we already talked about this. The reason why you want to avoid probate, not only does it take at least a year, it, 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 there are a lot of forms involved. It's complicated. You probably have to hire a lawyer. You're going to pay, you're, you know, you're, you're, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. are going to pay four or $5,000 in legal fees. Um, and it would al also, when they're trying to sell that house, it's easier to sell the, the, uh, the uh, house if the asset is not having to go through the probate process. So the question is, how do you avoid probate? Well, I'm going to go down to the tangible personal property. The stuff in the house. Technically, when Mary dies, the stuff in the house, which is hers, uh, can't be divided unless they go through the probate process. But as a practical matter, it never happens. I've been doing this now for ever, uh, 41 years. I have never seen a case where personal, tangible personal property, the stuff in the house, caused there to need to be a probate. Because typically, the kids just divide it up. 
Now, if you're really worried that the kids are going to fight about this, then the way to take care of that would be to actually do a will and say in your will um, how you want the property to be divided up and leave a little memorandum in, attached to your will. And then when you die, the person you name as the personal representative can go to the others and say, so look, we got two ways we can divide up this property. We can either just do what Ma said and just go in and divide it up and we'll just follow the list. Or I can hire a lawyer, we can go to probate, we can spend three or $4,000, and then we can go to that same list and divide up the property the same way. So what do you want to do, right? And at that case, in that point, they always surrender and everybody says, well, no, we'll just divide it up. So the personal property is never an issue. Um, regarding the issue is things that have a title to it. Your house, for which there's a deed. And if I'm the buyer of the house, I want to make sure that I'm buying from the right person if you die. And so if you die, that's why it needs to go through probate if it's just in your name. The car. The car is one of the, I'm just going to mention the car. So the car isn't an issue when you've got a spouse. Because when the spouse dies, even if the spouse owns the car individually, there's a special state statute that says that if it's a pleasure vehicle, it's presumed that that car was held jointly with the surviving spouse. So the surviving spouse can just show up at the Registry of Motor Vehicles with a death certificate and a marriage certificate, and they'll change the car into your name. When Mary dies, though, without a spouse, I mean, she could always solve this by getting remarried, but I, I, sometimes I suggest this, and people say, no, not a little too extreme. Um, but if she dies and she has no spouse, then it has to go through probate, unless she owns the property jointly with someone. If you own property jointly with someone, jointly with rights of survivorship, the legal consequence of that is that when one of you dies, that person's interest evaporates, leaving the other person as the sole owner. So there's no need for that asset to go through probate. So if you worry about your car and you're married, typically what I tell them is just put the car in joint names with one of the other kids, Peter, Paul, or Mary Jr., right? Just handle it that way. And if there's a concern about balancing out the other assets, well, then you're going to have to deal with it in another way. But that, that's kind of the And then if your child says, oh, but I don't want to be in the car with you. Ma, you're a terrible driver. I'm going to get sued. Well, then you have to increase your insurance. That's just kind of the way it goes. So that's the car. Regarding uh, the house, typically, or the easiest thing that Mary can do, the easiest, least expensive thing that she can do, is to either uh, put her kids jointly with her on the house, jointly with rights of survivorship, uh, or do a life estate, do a deed to her children, have a deed to her children in which she retains something called a life estate. That is total control of the house until the moment of her death. That's what a life estate is. The moment of her death, her life estate evaporates, leaving the kids as the sole owners of the property. The kids are called the remainder men, and they become the owners of the remainder of the property. That is the least expensive way to handle making sure that Mary's house doesn't go through probate. Now, there are a couple of disadvantages to doing that, and, you, and, and Mary's just going to need to consider those, or you need to consider them if you're, if you're using this device. One, if you transfer your home to uh, your kids but keep a life estate, and, and then you need to sell the house, uh, or want to sell the house, only your life estate is going to be subject to your capital gains exemption, the exemption that you have of $250,000 by virtue of being, having lived in the house for at least two years. So if that's a concern to you, that you're going to be selling the house during your lifetime, you may not be wanting to use that device. Uh, second, um, th there are situations where you may want to have control of that house back. I'll give you two quick examples. Uh, one a lady did this, did a transfer out to a, a ch one, she only had one child, so there was no issue about the kids fighting, kept a life estate. Uh, one of the reasons she did this, and I'll, I'll mention this a little bit later on, was that another advantage of structuring things this way is, is for mass health purposes, if she transfers the house out, the remainder interest to the kids, uh, or to the child in this case, and, that and, and waits five years, after that five-year period, that interest that she's transferred to the kids can no longer be counted or subject to a mass health lien if Mary needs to go into a nursing home. So, so in this case, the mother had done that, transferred it to the son. It was about 10 years before, so the house was safe. The property was on Martha's Vineyard, uh, so it wasn't a big house, but it was Martha's Vineyard, so it was worth $800,000. 
Uh, and the mother called me and said, I just want to make sure I don't have a problem. She said, my son just called me and he said he just got served with divorce papers from his wife. He said, do, do I have a problem? I said, oh yeah, you got a problem, right? Because the son owns the remainder interest in the house. The mother at that point was about 85 years old. Uh, it, when, when folks are valuing remainder interests and life estates in the house, the older you are, the smaller the percentage of the value that gets attributed to the life estate and the more gets remain attributed to the remainder because your life estate keeps shrinking because you, you're, you're not going to live very long. And so at her age, the life estate was worth less than 20% of the house. The remainder interest was worth 80% of $800,000, right? And that's what was going to be part of the divorce between the son and the wife. Second example, uh, also in Martha's Vineyard, person had, or a couple had transferred their interest out to their three kids, kept a life estate, for, once again, wanting to protect it, avoid probate, and protect it for, for these nursing home purposes. Time had gone by, they're all good, now it's 15 years later. They want to move back to Boston, where they were from originally. Um, they're both healthy, they're in their 80s, but they don't have a lot of money. The house is on Martha's Vineyard, so it's gone up in value too. It's fairly close to the water, actually, to you know, almost a million dollars. Um, and so they call their kids, because for them to sell their house now, they need to, if, you know, they didn't want, they need everybody to sign on. What they wanted their kids to do was transfer the house back to them so that they could own the whole house for two years so that they could sell it and get their capital gains exemption. And two of the kids were fine with that, but the third one wasn't. And so they called and they said, what can we do? And I said, nothing, there's nothing you can do. Can't force that child to convey the interest back. They said, well, what, is there any, can we force a sale of the house? And I said, yes, you can go to probate court and do a petition to partition the house, have the house sold and the proceeds divided up. But I said, you're only going to be entitled to your life estate piece, which is about 20% of the value of the house. And they said, well, what about a reverse mortgage? Because they, their, their issue was they just didn't have any money, you know, and they wanted to, you know, the income wasn't great enough to keep them living. And I said, you could do that. I said, your problem is that all the kids have to sign the reverse mortgage, right? So is that child that doesn't want to convey you the property going to sign that reverse mortgage? So it's, it can be a problem, right? So if there are problems like that, for folks like Mary, who, who are concerned about avoiding probate, but at the same time don't want to lose that kind of control uh, or make their property kind of vulnerable for those reasons, that's when folks will do a, re a, a revocable and amendable trust. Yes? I'm going to do all questions at the end, okay. but thank you, Keith. Um, a revocable and amendable trust. She will name herself as the trustee, that is, the person in legal control. She'll be able to amend this trust at any time. It'll be for her benefit and the benefit of her other kids. But she will say, in the trust, following her death, one of the kids, the one she was going to name as the personal representative, will immediately step into her shoes and be able to sell the house. Won't have to wait the year property won't go through probate. It's not subject to the claims of any creditors. That's the reason why folks will do a revocable and amendable trust. And because the trust um, is not affecting her control over the house while she's alive, the trust is, so, is, is called a so-called grantor taxable trust, which means for federal and Massachusetts income tax purposes and estate tax purposes is as if the trust doesn't exist. So if she goes to sell the house, even though she's, it's in trust, she gets her capital gains exemption. When she dies, the so-called tax basis in the house jumps to the date of death value. We're going to talk a little bit about, more about taxation in a few minutes. So she gets, the advantage, she gets no tax disadvantages, but she gets the advantage of avoiding probate. Now, once again, when couples come in and say they really want to put their property into this kind of trust, I'll tell them we can certainly do that, but you don't need to. You don't need to. As long as there's two of you, if, and typically you own those properties jointly, when one dies, the other one becomes the sole owner. The time to talk about this is especially when you're single, okay? Uh, now, everything a single person should know about taxes, well, not really everything, but a couple of real important things, and a couple of these are affected by the, the kind of the new tax law. First, there is no gift tax. There is no gift tax as a practical matter. Anybody here have heard that if, if, if you give away more than $15,000 to somebody in one year, something bad happens? I see some, you're, you're nodding. Do you know what that bad thing is that happens? The answer really is nothing bad happens. 
It's all made up. It's all made up. But it used to be that this was of some significance, but it's not, okay? Um, the, 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 that's the short answer. The, the, the longer piece of that answer is that it's only of relevance if when you die, your estate will be worth more than $11 million. If it is, and you give away more than $15,000 to someone in one year, you're supposed to tell the federal government you did that so they can subtract the extra from the 11 million that you're allowed to give at death, right? So if you give one of your kids $115,000 this year, you're supposed to file a gift tax return next year telling the government you did that so that they can take the 115, subtract the 15, take the remaining 100, and subtract it from the $11 million that you can give at death. So now you can only give away $10,900,000 at death. So you see, it just doesn't make any difference. None of this, and if you don't file the gift tax return, the only penalty for not filing gift, the gift tax return is they add to the amount that you would have owed in gift tax. But unless you've given away over your lifetime more than $11 million, there is no gift tax, which means there's no penalty for not filing the gift tax return. So that's the gift tax return. So now a little bit about the estate tax avoiding the estate tax. Remember that Mary's estate, if she dies tomorrow, was a million one hundred thousand dollars. And I'm assuming that that's all taxable, that she can't do deductions for the expenses of the estate and other stuff, just because it makes the math more fun. Okay, so briefly, a little history of the estate tax. Um, the estate tax in Massachusetts, like the federal one, was created in the early 20th century, at the time when people were concerned, like today, about uh, robber barons accumulating a lot of assets and then just leaving it to their kids tax-free. So just by virtue of being lucky enough to have been born to a person who was worth a billion dollars, you get a billion dollars <laughs> tax-free. You didn't do anything. And the government doesn't participate in that at all, and even though everybody else is paying income taxes and all that. So that was the idea behind the estate tax, was to deal with that. And at the time the estate tax was created, $40,000 was a lot of money. And so what they said in the estate tax was, okay, we're going to tax everybody over $40,000 that has an estate of more than $40,000. And we're going to tax them in, in, in increments. It's, it's like the graduated income tax. We're going to take a, a chunk of money, the amount between $40,000 and $90,000, and we're going to tax it at eight-tenths of 1%. Then we're going to take the amount between $90,000 and $150,000. We're going to tax it at 1.6%, et cetera. And, that, and so they adopted this chart. And that chart still exists. The exact same chart has never been changed since it was created. And according to that chart, if you died today with an estate of $100,000, your estate tax would be $560. It wasn't a really big tax, you know, it was something. At $500,000, your estate tax would be twelve million four, or 12,004. At a million, and we're going to get back to this million because you've all heard about the million dollar exemption. At a million, your estate tax is $36,560. And at a million one, your estate tax would be $42,640. Now, so then time went on. This chart was still in effect, but real estate values kept going up. And so it got to be the, that everybody that owned a house was paying an estate tax because real estate went up so much. And so finally, the constituents went to their legislators and said, this is terrible. You need to do something about this. So they could have done one or two things. They could have changed the chart, right? But that was too complicated. So instead, what they did was they changed, all they did was they changed the amount below which there was no estate tax. And remember, the original amount was $40,000, as I mentioned earlier. And originally, they moved it up to $100,000. Then they moved it to $500,000 and six, and now it's a million dollars. So now, if you're Mary and you die and you have a taxable estate of $1,100,000, what your, what your tax preparer has to do is do two calculations. First, they figure out how much you would have owed according to the chart. The chart, remember, according to the chart, you would owe, your estate would owe $42,640, right? Um, if there was an estate, if your estate were worth less than a million, your, your, your estate tax would be zero. But then, what they, what they did when they created that, that kind of line and they said no tax below that, that, that line is that, this, and this happened right, right the, from the first time they did this, the question then was, well, what if your estate is a dollar over? 
What if you have a dollar over $100,000? Or in this case, a dollar over a million? What if you have a one million one dollars? Well, the way some states treated that, and actually Rhode Island was one of those until about three or four years ago, they had what was, what was referred to as a cliff tax, right? They had a chart, they had a line below which you didn't pay, and then if you were a dollar over the line, you fell off the cliff. And you owed all the money that you would have owed according to the chart. So what Massachusetts did was kind of a modified version of that. They said, if you're over a million dollars, your estate tax will be 40% of all the dollars over a million, or the amount that you owed on, according to the chart, whichever one is less. So if you have a million dollar estate, your estate tax is zero. If you have an estate of a million one hundred thousand dollars, you have to do the two calculations. You remember the chart says you owe forty-two thousand six hundred forty dollars. If you do the, the, the 40 percent, 40 percent of all the dollars over a million, or 40 percent of one hundred thousand dollars, is forty thousand dollars. Which one's lower? Forty thousand dollars. So still at a million one, you're, you're, you're using the chart. Now as you can see, by the time you get to a million one, the amount that you pay with the 40 percent is getting really close to the amount on the chart because the tax rate, as far as the chart is concerned, is only about 6%. So you're paying much more than what the chart would have, would have had you owe. So the place the lines cross is around $1,125,000. But the main thing for Mary to remember is that if she's got an estate of a million one, effectively, she's got a tax of 40% of all the dollars over a million. So she has a tremendous incentive to get her estate below a million dollars before she dies, or she doesn't, because she's going to be dead. But to the extent that she doesn't want to leave it to the government and does want to leave it to Peter, Paul, and Mary, she has an incentive to get it below a million. So what are the ways that she could do that? Well, one way is she could give everything away before she, gets, she dies, like the day before she dies. So if she is concerned about as most people are, about keeping control of her assets while she's alive, but at the same time wants to avoid the estate tax, one thing she can do is she could tell whoever's her trustee, remember, we, we, you know, we, we, or, or her power, her, has her power of attorney, whoever has control over her assets, before I die, give it all away. Because if she dies and, and she's given it all away the day before she died, now she, she has an estate of zero, and therefore her tax is zero. Zero. Uh, what she'd really like to do is just, though, to get down to that magic number, you know, that $100,000 or the million dollars, because she knows if she has an estate that's worth less than a million dollars, then she pays no estate tax. That is the only place right here where that $15,000 number is of significance. If she's giving money away in one year to um, one person that is more than $15,000, then the extra money when she dies gets added back into her estate. So if she wants to get to that number, if she actually just gives away $100,000 as a result of all of this, she's still going to be paying an estate tax. That's the amount, $36,650. If, on the other hand, she has told her daughter, you know, before I die, you don't have to give everything away but we're going to give enough away to get my estate down below a million dollars, but you're only going to give it in $15,000 increments. So we're going to give $15,000 to Peter, $15,000 to Paul, $15,000 to Mary, $15,000 maybe to some of the grandchildren, right? Enough so that at the moment of her death, she's below a million and she gave things away in increments of less than $15,000 a year. If she does that, then she also avoids the estate tax. Isn't that magic? But you never heard that before, right? So you can actually avoid the estate tax. Now, the one asset, though, that she may not want to give away is the house because of a different tax, the capital gains tax. So now we're going to talk about that a little bit. The capital gains tax system, 101, especially for Mary. So say Frank and Mary had bought their house for $50,000. It is now worth, as I mentioned in the earlier slide, $400,000. Now, for tax purposes, when Frank and Mary bought the house for $50,000, they each got a basis, a tax basis in that house of half of that amount. So one got $25,000 and the other got $25,000. If they sell the house for $400,000, right, together, 
their total basis is $50,000. They sell for $400,000. They're going to have a capital gain. The capital gain is $350,000. The tax on that capital gain would be $70,000, or about 20% of their total capital gain. However, if they've been living, owned the house and lived in the house for the last two years, they, get, they each get an exemption of $250,000. Their total exemption is $500,000. 500 is more than 350, and therefore there's no tax. If Frank dies, so right now we're just talking about Mary, same house which was bought for $50,000. Right now, Mary's basis in the property is calculated this way. Remember, at the time she bought the house, she got a basis of 25,000. That was half the purchase price. Frank's basis, when he died, jumped to the date of death value. Because when you own property that has appreciated in value, that's gone up in value during your lifetime, your basis in that property jumps from what you bought it for to the date of death value. So at, at Frank's death, the house was worth 400000 So his piece of the basis jumped from twenty five to two hundred, And that became Mary's, because Mary now owns all the house. So Mary's basis is now that two hundred plus her old 25 or $225,000. If she sells the house for $400,000, her capital gain is $400,000 minus $225,000 or $175,000. So she would owe a capital gain, except if she's been living in the house for two of the last five years, she gets an exemption, $250,000, and therefore she doesn't pay a capital gain. However, if she gives her house to the kids, and then dies, or, in, and doesn't, or doesn't die. When she gives her house to the kids, she gives her kids her basis. And when they go to sell the house, unless they're living in the house, they're going to pay a capital gains tax. They're going to pay a tax of $70,000. Because if they sell for $400,000, their capital, their capital gains tax is going to be big, big, right? Actually, that is incorrect. If, if Frank and Mary had sold, had given the house to the kids, then their basis would have been 50, this $50,000, the capital gain would have been that. If Frank dies and Mary gives the house to the kids, Mary's basis is the $225,000. The kids are still going to pay a capital gains tax on the difference between 400 and 225,000. So that's the reason why often people will keep their real estate until they die and not just give it to their kids. Now, one note from something else that I mentioned. Remember, one of the popular ways of avoiding probate is to transfer an interest to your kids called the, re the remainder interest and keep a life estate. If you do that, then for this purpose, when you die, if you're still there and you've you got the life estate, your basis still, still jumps up to the date of death value. So going back to that example of just giving the house away to the kids, if Mary gave the house and kept the life estate, and then died, the kids would get this stuff up in basis. But as this relates to the earlier slides regarding how Mary can avoid the estate tax, Mary can avoid the estate tax by giving everything away before she dies. What she wants to be careful of is she makes sure that by doing that, she doesn't end up saddling her kids with a capital gains tax. One way for her to do that would be, as I had mentioned, Day before she dies, have her transfer that remainder interest in the house to the kids and keep a life estate. The moment of her death, which is the next day, her interest ev evaporates. There's no probate. The basis jumps to the date of death value, and the kids can sell the property capital gains tax-free. Now, I know that was a lot, <laughs> but, it, but, it's, but though, if you're Mary, if you're in this situation, kind of the bottom line is you need to make sure you do the math on these questions, because you can avoid these taxes as long as you're paying attention. Mary's other goal uh, is to not run out of money before she dies. There are several things that she can do to not run out of money. Uh, one is to get a reverse mortgage on the house. People, whenever I say that word, people cringe. You know, oh, a reverse mortgage, that's terrible. The bank's going to own the house. No. A reverse mortgage is, a, is a, an equity loan on the house. You know what an equity loan is? You go to the bank, you got a house, and you say, I need some money. And the bank will say, OK, we're going to take a percentage of the value of the house. And we're going to lend you, we're going to give you a line of credit based on the percentage of the value of the house. And, the, and you're going to sign a promissory note 
back to the bank, right? Promising to pay back whatever you have borrowed on the line of credit. And you're going to give the bank a mortgage to secure the, the promissory note. And the deal is, unless you borrow money on that, pro on, that, on that line of credit, you don't owe them any money. From the moment you do borrow some money, however, you're going to owe, starting the following month, an interest payment on the amount that you borrowed. So that, and so the, the, the line of credit loan, or the, the home equity loan, is due when you die, or when you sell the property, or if you don't make these monthly payments, because then, of course, that's a default and you can get foreclosed under the mortgage. So what is a reverse mortgage? It is exactly what I just said. You go to the bank and you say, I want, to borrow, I want a line of credit, and the bank says, OK, how old are you, and what's the value of the property? They'll go do an appraisal of the property. The older you are, the bigger the percentage of the value of the house that they will give you is your line of credit. Typically now, if you're younger, like in your 60s, um, that percentage will be about 40%. If you're older, like in your 80s, high 80s, it will be closer to 60%, right? So now you'll have this line of credit loan. You don't owe any money on it unless you borrow on it. If you borrow on it, then interest starts accruing. It is due, the, the, and, the, and the payoff of the mortgage is when you sell the house, when you die, actually it's not when you die, it's a year after you die. You have a year in, to either, the, your heir, heirs do either to sell the house and therefore get the, the mortgage paid off or to refinance. Um, but that's it. Oh no, excuse me. Or if you have left the house and not lived there for 365 consecutive days. So if you decide to move out of your house because you're going to assisted living, because you're going to a nursing home or whatever, I always tell folks, if you've got a reverse mortgage and you want to be very careful, because the banks really don't check this, but if you really want to be careful, go back to your house once a year. First, an every anniversary, go to your house, spend the day, take a picture of yourself, picture of the newspaper maybe with the date, you know. So, because as long as you're there one out of every 365 days, the reverse mortgage does not come due. It only comes due when you die, a year after you die or when you sell the house. And the amount that you owe, just like with your, line of, your, your home equity loan, is the amount of the note plus the amount of the interest. The only other thing about the reverse mortgage is that you don't have to make the monthly payments. It, it is not a default under the, the mortgage for you to fail to make your monthly interest payment on the amount that you owe. If you don't make that payment, all that happens is that that amount, the interest, gets added into your principal, and therefore the following month your principal has gone up by a little amount, equal to that amount that you didn't pay, and therefore the bill goes up the following, amount, the, the following month. So that's the only difference. So a reverse mortgage for a person like Mary, who, who feels that she's got the house, she's got some other savings, but she really wants to know there's some extra money you know, if she really, really needs it, can be a really handy device. Uh, deferring, deferring, uh, deferring house taxes. If you have been a resident for at least five years of the town and a resident of the Commonwealth for at least 10, and you're over 62 years old, uh, and your income is below a certain amount, and I apologize, I don't know that amount. I didn't check in Hopkinton. It is between 20 and $70,000, depending on how much Hopkinton has said it should be because this varies from town to town. Uh, as long as your income qualifies, there is no asset qualification for this. You can defer your taxes for as long as you want until you die. Uh, and then the t in the town, it's like the town giving you a reverse mortgage. The town will charge interest on that, which they can, up to no higher than 8%, but the town establishes those rates, and we'll get those, I'll get those rates for you. And I, I know we're, we'll rebroadcast this on cable, and we'll have that by the time it goes on cable. And if anybody wants that number, you have my handout. Just email me, and I'll get you the numbers for, for just Hopkinton. I just I failed to do it. Um, but the bottom, the bottom line is that, that you, know, you can get a reverse mortgage basically from the town on all of your taxes until you die. And the reason why I mention that is that for many people, after food, that is their second biggest bill, is their tax bill, right? And so as a cash flow matter, this can make a big deal as far as staying at home. Uh, staying at home when you need help. If you're married, these are the things you want to consider. You wanna, if you're still young enough, you want to see if you can buy long-term care insurance. Long-term care insurance is important for uh, a couple of reasons. One, it's not important 
if you think it's going to pay the cost of your nursing home care, which is why these policies were originally developed. But nursing home care is so expensive that the premium for buying that kind of policy is really huge. What it's really good for is for buying care if you want it at home. Remember Mary's goal is to live in her house until she dies. But suppose she gets to the point, now Frank's gone, right? And say the kids aren't around or they're working, so they're not around all the time. And she needs some help at home and she needs to go buy it. Now the cost of that care today around here is gonna be about $25 an hour. Say she needs quite a few hours. Say she, so say she has bought a long-term care insurance policy for $150 a day. $150 a, that'll pay $150 a day for say a couple of years. So as a practical matter, at $150 a day, she can buy six hours of home care a day, right, for two years. That's a long time. And she doesn't necessarily have to be using it every day. It may be that, one of, that her daughter or one of her sons is coming over on the weekends. She needs to purchase it during the day. So having that in her back pocket, as opposed to knowing that if she needs it, she's gonna be needing to drain her savings to pay for that home care, that's really a big deal. So you should, they, you should check it out. You should check it out. Even if you are over 70, check it out. Policies are written to people who are over 70, they just, but they have to meet certain health criteria because people don't wanna be writing a policy knowing that that person is gonna be needing it right away. Um, there are some other programs. There, there is a state funded program that will help you take care of quite a bit of this called the Frail Elder Waiver. I'm just gonna briefly talk about that. There is a state funded program before I do that for folks who just need a little bit of care at home. You know, they're just, maybe some, some, some meals prep, you know, maybe some just very basic stuff. There was a program, it's not asset based, so, you could, so Mary could qualify for it today. Um, there is a copay that she would have to pay depending on her income, but it will provide from six to 10 hours a week of care. The program is state funded. Uh, the, the folks to talk to are at Bay Path Elder Services. Bay Path Elder Service is the aging services access point for this region. That is, they were the nonprofit entity through which the state and the federal government funnel all of their money for seniors. So if you got any questions about these programs, talk to them. If you need a lot of care at home, say you're married, once again, you wanna live in your house until you die. If you need a lot of care at home, the only program that's gonna give you more than that number of hours uh, is a program called the Frail Elder Waiver. The Frail Elder Waiver only works for you uh, if you can show, though, that, that you have less than $2,000 in countable assets. The house is not a countable asset. The other assets that Mary has are. Um, in order to qualify this program, you need to be medically eligible, which means you need to show that you need physical assistance on a regular basis, not necessarily daily, but on a regular basis with two of the five activities of daily living. There they are, dressing, eating, bathing, toileting, transferring, or that you need regular supervision because you have some cognitive issues so that you may otherwise wander and you, you're just not, it's not safe for you to be at home alone, right? If you are Mary and you have these other assets and you wanna qualify for this program, but you've got these, all this other money and you're saying, well, oh my God, I can never qualify, right? Because I have to show I have less than $2,000 in countable assets. Without getting into the details of these, of these, you can still qualify. As long as you take that money and do one of three things with it. Uh, a, a, you either transfer the money to something called a D4C pooled trust, these are trusts that are run by nonprofit organizations for the benefit of seniors. The significance of the program uh, of these trusts for your purposes, if you're trying to qualify for the Frail Elder Waiver, is the day that you transfer those funds to the D4C, they're no longer yours as far as Mass Health is concerned. But once you've transferred them, the money from the trust can be used to supplement your own care. If you're married, to pay for the other house expenses, right? to do any number of things. So Mary could transfer the money to the D4C pooled trust, get her assets down below $2,000, and therefore qualify for the Frail Elder Waiver. Once she is qualified for that program, she'll be eligible for up to 40 to 50 hours of home care, which is a lot, oh, per week, per week, which is a lot, to the extent that she needs more care than that. She'll now have this other pot of money from which she can draw, the money that she put into the D4C pooled trust. Another way that she can handle that would be by buying a new, an annuity. 
Uh, an annuity is simply a contract between you and an insurance company. You buy an annuity, you, buy, you pay the, annuity, the, the company money, they agree to pay you back that money together with some interest, very crummy interest. Uh, and, and as long as those payments are, are equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than your life expectancy, you can purchase that annuity in any amount, use any of the cash to turn that annuity into an income stream. Once again, the day after you've done, done that, that money that you paid the, for the annuity no longer counts as an asset of yours. You're now getting this additional income stream that can help you, if you're married, pay for some of that home care while at the same time qualifying for the Frail Elder Waiver. Uh, one other thing, though, about the Frail Elder Waiver program that I'll just mention. There is a deductible in this program. Uh, if you have monthly, in monthly income of more than $2,250, that's the current number, it goes up every year a little bit, then um, you have to use some of your money uh, to, for your own home care before the Frail Elder Waiver will kick in. You would think, if you had this kind of program, that if, you were, if your monthly income were $2,251, like $1 over the deductible amount, your deductible would be a dollar. But it's not. It's not. Your deductible ends up being a big number. It's the difference between your income and about $600. So in this case, Mary's income, you, you may remember from a slide way back, was $2,500 a month. She had $2,000 in Social Security and $500 in pension. In her case, therefore, her deductible would be $1,900, or $2,500 minus about $600. So she would only, if she had that kind of income, she would only, this program would only be beneficial to her if she knew that she was having to buy a lot more hours and paying for those hours through her long-term care insurance policy, through her reverse mortgage, or through the money that she just put into the D4C pool trust. Oh, we just talked about that. Assisted living, we're not going to have time to talk about. I think I'm going to skip those and see if you have questions. Uh, oh, no, I'm just going to mention this. That long-term care insurance policy that I talked about, as I mentioned, there are two benefits of it. One is if you're getting that, that kind of home care. The other is if you have a long, and this is especially, you want to note this if you already have one of these policies. If you have a long-term care insurance policy that will pay at least $125 a day for at least two years, and you go from your home to a nursing home, the effect of having that long-term care insurance policy is that your house is safe, no matter what it's worth, no matter what it's worth. I know I do a lot of these presentations in uh, Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, where everybody's house is more worth a lot. Um, and it's a very, very inexpensive way of protecting your home. It does not protect your other assets, but it does protect your home. Uh, qualifying for mass health at the la last minute, I'm just going to mention this. This is, th this is just, it's important for, for for you to understand this. Often I'll get a call from someone who's who, typically their mother or their father is now they're single, so we can't do any asset transfers to the spouse, and they're needing to be in a nursing home. And they're saying, what do we do? We didn't make it do any planning. Ma has $200,000 in cash. Uh, do we have to spend it all down at the nursing home and then apply for MassHealth? And my answer to them is no, actually. You can apply for MassHealth almost immediately. And you want to do that. Now, once you do that, once you use that cash and put it someplace else, wherever you put it, MassHealth is going to have a lien on that money to get repaid after you, after you die. But the reason why you want to qualify for MassHealth is the difference between the nursing home cost at the private pay rate and at the MassHealth rate. In a typical nursing home, so I'm just using these numbers broadly, um, so this is a fairly expensive nursing home, but there are several in this area that are this number. Um, say that Mary's private pay at that nursing home is $14,500 a month. Now, typically, nursing homes around here do run from about ten dollars to $15,000 a month. Remember, her income was $2,500. So the amount of her burn rate, the rate at which she's going to have to use her savings while she's in the nursing home to cover the bill, in that case, is $12,000 a month, $14,500 minus her income, which was $2,500 a month. If she can re restructure her assets so that she can qualify for MassHealth, the day she qualifies for MassHealth, that same nursing home bed in that same nursing home 
the, the monthly cost is going to go down to about $6,500 a month. That's an approximation. MassHealth negotiates different nursing home rates with every nursing home. But, the but in all cases, the differential is huge. Say that's the case in this nursing home. What that means, from Mary's perspective, is that her burn rate, instead of being $12,000 a month on private pay, once she's on MassHealth, is only $4,000 a month. Her income, the $2,500 a month that she's going to pay, even if she's on MassHealth, um, minus the, the, the or, or, or subtracted from the $6,500 a month, which is the, the nursing home rate on MassHealth. So if, she, if Mary lives for a year on private pay in that nursing home, she will have spent $144,000, right? She will have burned away 12,000 times 12 months. If she's on MassHealth, then she will have only burned away 12 times $4,000 or $48,000. So she always wants to qualify for MassHealth. Now remember, we already talked about the two ways that she could do that. She could transfer these funds into a uh, D4C pool trust, or she could purchase an annuity with those funds. Now remember, in both of those cases, she is not avoiding having to repay MassHealth for whatever MassHealth has paid on, on her behalf. But what she has done is tremendously reduced the monthly cost to her of being in that nursing home. I just wanted to make sure I got that in before we were done. Any questions? We covered a tremendous amount of material. Otherwise, thank you very much. Enjoy the summer. We'll see you in the fall. Thank you all.